Yeah, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank IRAS for inviting me over to speak to you about this particular subject, which is slightly technical in nature. Now, when uh, Sir Rajiv Dutt called me up and told me that uh, would I like to come and speak out here, I was obviously enthused about it. And as we did speak about a presentation, I also got to know that he's from Delhi School of Economics. So there was some common bond which was there, which we have just discussed some time back. I spoke also to Mr. Sanjeev Jain and uh, realized that we had actually gone to the same school, St. Columbus School. And I thought the only missing link in my own experience here with IRA is, because I'm working as a corporate economist and you're in public service, is the St. Stephen's College part. And then I bump into uh, Mr. Vinayak Rao. I find it odd to call him Mr. Vinayak Rao. We call him Vinayak when we were in college. He's one year senior to me. And uh, so it was nice to know that he's also out here and uh, sort of renewing our acquaintance uh, from, the old, from the earlier days. I've also uh, realized that I'm uh, differently attired than the gentleman out here. Uh, there's no suit or anything of that sort. And probably one of the conclusions you may draw is that this guy must be from Bombay because he doesn't know how cold it is in Delhi. To my experience in Delhi is over 27 years back and I may be cut off from the reality of the Delhi cold. But then no, we people as economists tend to be a different breed and we take things very casually, tend to be a bit informal. And so when I'm making this presentation to you, even I'll try and keep it informal so that it's a very serious issue and I make it a bit lighter in that uh, sense. So the way I thought I'll go about it is that uh, I'll give you a kind of a preamble about uh, this particular issue of FDI and uh, railways. I also have a formal presentation, which I'll just run through the slides later on. And then we could have an interaction form of a conversation if you have any questions. Or more importantly, I would say after hearing the learned men out here, learned men and women, I would think that you will have probably a lot of advice to give me about how I should be looking at uh, FDI and uh, railways. Now, all of us in the country are concerned about uh, economic growth. We had a path of 8 to 9 percent growth, which we had for a very long period of time, which we took for granted. And then later on, we saw a couple of years back, somehow we slipped up somewhere and growth slipped around 4.5%. And today, with the new government in power, we are all looking at uh, Achedin, good days coming and returning to this 8 to 9% growth. While a lot has been done in order to make sure that this happens over a period of time, I think one of the stumbling blocks which we've always had is um, infrastructure. So when we talk of uh, infrastructure, we refer to roads, railways, ports, airports, urban infrastructure, telecom, power. So these are all the segments which we look at when we talk of uh, infrastructure. And quite evidently, there's a deficit in not just the amount of infrastructure which we have, but also in terms of the quality of infrastructure, which has been coming in the way of our growth. Now, there's one argument, of course, saying that even though we complain a lot about the power crisis, the problems which we have in the power sector, the Indian economy has actually done well, notwithstanding the fact that we've had these problems. But if you just turn the question around and say that what in case I had better infrastructure in the country, will my time taken to ferry my goods from place A to place B actually come down? Will this bring about efficiency? Will this improve the profitability of overall business? And will this lead to even higher economic growth? as we have seen happening in countries like China, the obvious the answer is yes. We need to have this kind of infrastructure. Now, based on what the Planning Commission had put out, they're saying that what kind of investment do we require in infrastructure? So this roughly translates to something like $200 billion on an annual basis. So if I do a backup for the envelope calculation, I require around 12 lakh crores of funds to flow into these seven, eight sectors which we're talking of. The question, of course, is where are these funds going to come from? Gone are the days when the government would be in a position to provide the funds, because there was a time, if I remember, when I started my career in the late 80s and also in the 90s, where the government had lots of allocations for infrastructure, and we always looked upon to the government to come and fill up this deficit. But today, with the FRBM being in place, and the government making it very clear that while it will be an enabler of growth, to be an enabler of creation of infrastructure, on its own, it may not be able to contribute significantly because there are other priorities in terms of balancing the budget. So if I look at all the long-term sources of finance, 
which could be going into infrastructure. It's a fairly scary position because I'm talking in terms of getting something like 12 lakh crores of uh, funds coming into infrastructure, into several pockets into which it has to go into. If I look at the banking system, which is probably one of the major dominant sources of finance in the country, not more than 15% of overall bank credit actually goes to infrastructure. So if I'm talking of incremental credit of around eight to nine lakh crores in an annum, per annum, 15% of that would be one to one and a half lakh crores, which actually goes into infrastructure. And mind you, the Reserve Bank of India has already pointed out that infrastructure, in particular the power sector and also at mining, are the major NPAs in the banking system. So if I were a banker today, and I was told that it's a project which has come up related to any of the infrastructure segments, I would be doubly careful when I'm lending my money because the propensity or the probability of a loan given to the infrastructure sector going bad is very much higher than that for of non-infrastructure. So I'm talking of one to one and a half lakh crores going to the infrastructure in the normal course of activity. If I look at the debt market, on an average, we raise something like three to four lakh crores of rupees, of which maybe half of that actually goes into infrastructure. Most of it is actually being garnered by the financial institutions and banks, which get relayed through bank credit. So if I add one and a half to two lakhs, I have something like three and a half lakh crores, and I'm still looking at a number of around 12 lakh crores. External commercial borrowings is something which the Reserve Bank of India is encouraging, and a large part of that does go for infrastructure. So I'm talking of another maybe 20 lakh crores, 25 uh, billion dollars, which translates to another one to one and a half lakh crores of funds going to through the ECB route. Which actually means that I still have a deficit of around five, six lakh crores, which has to come from somewhere if I'm going to create this kind of infrastructure. The obvious choice is that we look at foreign direct investment. Now, foreign direct investment was not a major source of finance for a very long time. It was only after 1991 that FDI actually entered our economic lexicon when we started talking about tapping international markets, trying to get foreigners to invest in India, try and make sure that there are opportunities and you provide the facilities to ensure that this becomes possible. So from 1991 onwards, we've had a series of changes in our outlook on FDI, the policies concerning FDI. And when we're talking of FDI, let's try and understand what it is. It's essentially, if I'm a foreign investor, I will be allowed to come and invest in India, depending upon the sector which the government has decided. There are certain proportions which are kept. Say, for example, I'll say if I want to enter the insurance sector, up to 26% of the equity in an insurance company can be held by a foreign company. If I'm in the telecom sector, it's higher. If I remember right, it's around 74%. If I'm talking in terms of railways, which has come up recently, they're saying that 100% in railway infrastructure. So we need to distinguish between railways per se, that is the general railways which we talk of, and railway infrastructure, which is the facilities, the kind of structures, the stations, the wagons, all the stock which goes into running the railways. Here, it's been opened up to 100%. If I'm talking of power sector, again, if I remember right, it's probably 100%, so you could come and invest in power. So depending upon the facilities or the limits which have been placed by the government, this is done by the Ministry of Industry, where they give what are the limits which are permit, permissible for foreign direct investment. Foreign investment has been coming into the country. Now, if you ask me, has this been a very large amount? Is it very exciting for foreigners? Honestly, we don't have a clear answer, because if I look at the kind of FDI coming into India on an annual basis, it's something like 30 to $40 million, which is spread across different segments. And this was the number when we started off, say, in the mid-1990s, maybe early 2000s. At that particular point of time, China was getting something like $100, $150 billion. But if I see what kind of progress has been made over the last 10 years, China has gone on to $400, $500, $600 billion. And we seem to be stuck up with this number of around $30 to $40 billion. So when we're talking of the lacunae which is there in terms of getting funds for financing infrastructure, FDI holds a lot of promise, but for this FDI to really materialize, we obviously need to do a lot of things to make sure it happens. Because if you ask me a question as to where does this FDI typically go to, normally they pick up sectors which are soft. When I say soft, where I come, I invest, there's very good demand, fewer hassles when it comes to regulation, 
fewer as, uh, problems when it comes to natural resources. So if I talk of consumer goods, I talk of the financial sector, I talk of the IT sector, these are the kind of soft spots for foreign direct investment. Because if I come, if I have a McDonald's set up here, I have Nike coming up out here, I'm sure there's a certain kind of demand which happens. It's a single product I'm dealing with. Everybody in the country wants to get westernized. We want to have access to these kind of products. So therefore, let me get into it. So if you look at the overall share of infrastructure in the FDI, which normally comes in on an annual basis, it won't be more than around 15 to 20%. And the reason is, of course, not even though I have larger limits which I kept for infrastructure, but there are lots of issues which come. And just think of me as a, as a FDI coming into the power sector. I think the Enron story is legendary right now. But just imagine I come into the power sector. The power sector requires a lot of reforms all through the stage of power generation, transmission, and distribution. To top it all, there are problems which we have in coal. So if I don't get the raw material, I cannot really generate power. So if I'm putting my investment in a sector like power, and there are lots of regulatory issues which are there, there are controversies which come up, it becomes a high risk factor for me. Instead, if I go into IT, so if you look at most of the IT companies, international IT firms are already in India, they are coming in full flow because it's a simple business to do it. I come, I put in my investment, there are no regulatory issues which are, when it comes to uh, IT, and I'm able to earn my returns. But the moment it comes to infrastructure, there are, of course, this nagging fear saying that if I come here, will, I, will my project get stalled on account of regulation? Now, in India, some of the problems which we have are things like land reforms, environment. So very often I start my project today. Somewhere along the way I get held up because there's a regulatory clearance required. Somebody goes to court saying I'm bringing about pollution, so therefore my project comes to a standstill. So this is one problem which is coming up. Similarly, if you're talking of land, can I get contiguous land when it comes for creating a road? Now, the, the, the land reforms, even though I think the, the discussion may not take place in the parliament this time, but even in future, it's going to be very, very contentious because there are no easy answers of saying, should I be supporting the corporate or should I be supporting the farmer? There are issues on both sides today with the cost of acquiring land being high. As an entrepreneur, if I want to set a project, it's just not viable because my cost of land is too high. The earlier dispensation which was provided by the, by the UPA government was skewed towards the corporate and against the farmer which really led to this kind of debate. And there's a kind of uh, a, a standstill which we have come to because of land issues. So overall, for a foreign direct investor, you would also be keen to know that the sector where I'm investing in should be a smooth sector, should have less regulatory issues, should have less, less problems, which mean going through the parliamentary process. Because the moment you go into the parliamentary process, we know today that even though the current NDA government has a majority in the Lok Sabha, they don't have the same thing in the Rajya Sabha. And for all these bills to be passed, I need to have the consent of both the houses. So things are not going to move smoothly, even though the government has an absolute majority. Now, out here, let me just try and distinguish between FDI investment and FI investment. Now, what we're talking of is foreign direct investment, where there is direct equity participation. The whole idea is to try and own the enterprise. And whatever controversies we have had over FDI in the country, especially when you're talking of things like FDI in retail or FDI in insurances, can a foreign body actually be owning the enterprise, which is creating infrastructure for the country? Now, as of today, we seem to be having a fairly open mind when it comes to infrastructure. We have reservations when it comes to retail. We have certain reservations when it comes to, uh, to, to the financial sector, especially on insurance and pensions. But otherwise, we seem to be fairly open when it comes to infrastructure. <clears throat> now, distinguishing from FDI, we need to look at uh, FIA investment. Now, if I look at FIA investment, these are basically people who are not really interested in running the company. They just want to make sure that if the company is listed, and in case I can buy the share at the right point of time, my main idea is to sell it and make a, make a profit and make sure that the investors who have invested in my fund are the ones who are getting adequate rewards. So, when we're talking of FDI in railways, let's keep in mind that we're not talking of FI, FIIs. We're not talking of these people who are coming in, flying in, and flying out, because they're not really interested in buying and owning the company or running the ship. Now, let's come to the situation of railways, which you all are more familiar with. Mine is more of an impressionistic view taken by an economist. Now, the way I look at this situation of railways is that it's one of the most efficient services provided by the government. I think nobody can deny this particular fact. It's also true, as has been 